Ready? Hello and welcome to Cabal of Adam. We're going to talk about war today. Part two. We're going to learn, there's a lot of um, mechanics that are within war. Since, since war is going on, I uh, thought, you know, we're learning about the first war, and what you're going to find is every war is just a holographic projection of the first war. Um, evil countries fight evil countries. Why do they do that? We're going to learn a lot of little things, and it's going to surprise you what Hashem is doing. There's nothing here but God. If there's nothing here but God, what is going on? And that's the question. That's the right question. Um, I'm going to try to show the 4D aspect, the secret aspect of what's going on in 3D uh, so, that, so that you are aware. I think I, 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 try, to, I try to do a lot of research for you guys for, for one reason. So you know what's coming. You may not know when it happens, but I'm going to I try to tell you based on the Torah that we've learned over the years and what the sages say in the Talmud, what the prophets say, what the Torah says, what's coming and what's going to happen. I want to give you a good idea of what to expect. And so uh, that way you're not caught off guard. In the, in, in the, in the meantime, within that, I want to try to show you why this is going on. We know what's going on, you know. Uh, it's, it's clear what's going on. But why is it going on? And what is Hashem doing? What does it look like to God? That's, that's the way I look at things. I got really controversial yesterday on Shalom 70 because I wanted to test the thermometer to see where people were. And people have drawn lines in the sand. And uh, I understand that. And as soon as you and as soon as, as soon as you pick a side, I don't care what side you pick, you know, we obviously support Israel. Or we wouldn't be doing what we're doing. Alright. As soon as you do that, you need to hold on to that loosely and you need to back up and you need to see what God's doing. What is the Shem doing? Because if you don't think Hashem is running both sides of this thing, you're a heretic. Okay? So, with that, I'm going to try to explain this from the, the view of the seven laws that run the world. Because the whole world, all the world is B'nai Noach. I don't care who you are, you're B'nai Noach. And you are under the seven laws, whether you accept them or not, and so you're bound by them. Guess what? God is bound by them too. He created them. He's not going to overstep or transgress his own laws. So he's going to have to work within them. And if he's going to work within them, you're going to have to see how it moves on the chessboard and then zoom out and go, okay, now maybe I have a, a better view of what God's doing. Those of you who, who follow me and have listened to me for almost 20 years now, you know at least for a decade I have been saying and teaching I know exactly how God is going to get the Jews back home to Israel. Anti-Semitism. And I've been telling y'all in these classes, it, you're going to see it, anti-Semitism like you've never seen it before. I've, I've been right on the money. Now, I, I used to think that the anti-Semitism was going to be caused by the destruction of the, church. the churches and the mosque in the land that is still coming, which is going to even make it higher. But I thought that was going to be the initial perception. But now, once you, once you see it happen, and you put the Torah on top of it, now you can see it a whole lot clearer. Let's say our prayer, and let's, let's learn some cool stuff. Rule the universe 
the master of all masters, Father of mercy and forgiveness. We thank you, our God and the God of our fathers, by bowing down and kneeling that you brought us closer to your Torah and your holy work, and that you enable us to take part in the secrets of your holy Torah. How worthy are we that you grant us with such a big favor. That is the reason we plead before you that you will forgive and acquit all of our sins and they should not bring separation between you and us. And may it be your will before you, our God and the God of our fathers, that you awaken and prepare our hearts to love and revere you. And may you listen to our utterances and open our closed heart to the hidden studies of your Torah. And may our study be pleasant before your place of honor as aroma of sweet incense. And may you emanate to us light from the source of our soul to all of our being. And may the sparks of your holy servants through which you revealed your wisdom to the world shine. May their merit and the merit of their fathers and the merit of the Torah and holiness support us so we shall not stumble through our study and by their merit enlighten our learning, enlighten our eyes and our learning as stated by King David, the sweet singer of Israel. Open my eyes so that I see wonders from your Torah. Because from his mouth, God gives wisdom and understanding. May the utterance of my mouth and the thoughts of my heart find favor for you, God, my strength and my redeemer. Amen. Amen. So I made some posts yesterday on Shalom 70 that were really sarcastically poignant on purpose because I wanted to see where people were. Uh, I didn't want to let this crisis go to waste. I'm not mocking the crisis at all. It, this, is, this is a Torah moment. And because we know that God judges the nations. And Avodah chapter 2b says that when the nations come, and, and God judges the nations, they come in erbuvia, mixture. They're all mixed up. And God says, no, get in your lane. You've never before seen more people getting in a lane than you have right now. Excuse me, did you turn your volume up? Mm -hmm. okay. Yeah. You, you've never seen more people get in a lane. Everybody is choosing a lane. And unfortunately, some of the lanes that have been chosen is is they are choosing Palestine, Palestinians over Israelis. No, no surprise there, right? But why do the governments do it, all right? So I, I realized yesterday that we have very little support, if any, if any, from people that we know. Very well. And so I stayed up late last night, did a lot of research. I woke up this morning and the moment my eyes came open, I remembered the, that I think, it, I think it's Psalm 146, 9 or something like that. Anyway, it says, God loves the gear. God loves a stranger because he knows nobody else does. <laughs> And I went and got in the shower, and I've told y'all many times in the shower, that's kind of when I get my download. And I'm sitting there in the shower, and this guy pops into my head. I'm not going to, his name's David, David. He's Jew. He lives in Jersey. And they got a lot of anti-Semitism up there. And we, we, we talk quite a bit on, on Facebook Messenger and stuff. We always check on each other. And he said that he knows of 363,000 Jews that have returned to Israel since October 7th in the midst of a war. Okay? Mm -hmm. Now, Russell, you know this guy. You know exactly who I'm talking about. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And for, I bet you, 10 years, this guy would text me every day. <laughs> And tell me he loved me. I've never met him. He's a, he's a Levite. They're like that. He's a Levite. Okay. Mm -hmm. He texts me almost every day. I'm talking. I'm talking. I, I'm a Texas man. Mm -hmm. And he sends me hearts, butterflies, unicorns, and rainbows. And tells me <laughs> he loves me. Yeah. Yeah. I didn't get it till this morning. He's true Hesed. And you know, mm -hmm. we've discussed it before, have we not? Mm -hmm. it's, we're yeah. like, it's, it's a little weird. <laughs> right? But, but he's so genuine, you don't he's take offense He's for real. Yeah. He, he's married. He's got a, a basketball team full of kids. Yeah. Right? Mm -hmm. And he really does love me. He really does. Yeah. And I thought, you know what? 
All you need is one. So it's the moment I got out of the shower, I get in my truck and I'm driving to work, I text him. Hey man, I just wanted to let you know I'm thinking about you and I love you. I hope you're okay. He, right back, I'm doing fine. And he, and he says, I love you. And he, he auto-corrected and it said, my bed friend. <laughs> <laughs> of course, I didn't have my glasses on at the time, and it said my dear friend, right? And so he put, you know, loud, 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 I autocorrected, and I meant to say my dear friend. I said, well, I'll be honest with you, I didn't have my glasses on when I read it, so I just saw D-E, I, I figured that's what you said, but I had a, I had a big kick out of it. So anyway, um, things are changing, and I believe everybody notices it. Now, it's time to go to the board. Oh, last couple, two, two weeks ago, I gave y'all a OE27, I think 515 to Google. Mm -hmm. But anyway, it is about the state of Israel and who owns the land, right? Remember that class? I put that in Cabal of Adam below this class. If you're on Facebook right now, but if, if, if you're going to watch it on YouTube, you're not going to see it. But below this uh, class, I, I copied and pasted so you can see it's right there. And then I also put today <clears throat> of the Roman control, the map. Now you have to understand, this is the last exile of Israel. We, it, it's the Roman exile. It's Edom that owns that whole territory that's, that's, that's going on right now. All right, and they still own it. And here's here's the issue. This is the seven sphero. This one is called the Malchut. Right? It's called the land, etc. Israel, you can call it Israel but it's also the earth. It's the Shekhinah. It's many, many things. And we've been studying this union here between Zah and Nook and that, and that the nations, the 70 nations, which is the backside of this seven that has 10 in it, is suckling from right here, this connection. And, and the Klippa has taken all the Shepha to the 70 nations and it owns that right there. If what is the seventh law? Courts of justice. Courts of justice. Courts of justice is legal. Legally. Legally. So if these people own this land legally and they wrote an article and signed it in 1917 and also again on April 14th 1948 and it legally ran out and they tried to do it again February 23rd 2023 of this year to give that land to the Knesset which is the government which those men are now a part of the WEF in Switzerland, World Economic Forum, including BB, they are a part of this. Because that thing is ran by Klaus Schwab, the guy that's trying to take over the world with all the globalists. They're trying to make a, trying to do a legal runaround because this is courts of justice. This is law of the land. Israel is under that. This is, this is why none of the rest of the G, G7, G8, whatever, G20, none of these UN, EU, none of them recognize Israel. They don't recognize them. That's a big term. I want you to recognize me. As a Gerto Shab, Israel, I want you to recognize me. This is this is what made him so mad yesterday. You know, 
You want the world to recognize you as Israel and not Palestine, but you can't recognize Gertosha legally. Oh, it made him mad. But we're dealing, we're dealing with courts of justice. So what's the answer? Well, when the Sanhedrin gets back, then we can recognize you legally. You know why? Because you don't own the land. Legally. Now, if we're dealing with courts of justice and all this fell through, they were, they were supposed to do the attack on Passover. It, they didn't, didn't make it. So when did they do it? On Sukkot. On, on, on uh, Simchat Torah. And I told y'all that I think something big is going to happen around Hanukkah. I think that's when it will be over and victory will be declared. Because they only got 25 miles to go. And they're already halfway through. And the whole world is calling genocide, right? Mm -hmm. Now we're going to talk about this war because this same thing happened in Genesis 14. What did they do? They took Lot hostage. Mm -hmm. You want to make Abraham mad? Take his kinfolk hostage. You want to make the Jews mad? Take someone hostage. Mm. See, you know, there's a saying called mess around and find out. You know, mm -hmm. I cleaned it up for everybody, right? <laughs> <laughs> well, now they're finding out. And all the ceasefire, well, if you let the people go, they'll probably stop. But if you won't let the they're gonna go, they're gonna go until you let the people go. Who wouldn't? My kid, your kid, anybody's kid, you're gonna go till they let the kid go. That's the way of war. Because war war has one reason. I think I spelled that right. Existence. We ain't gonna judge you. All right. Existence. Israel wants existence. They want to exist. Mm -hmm. What does Palestine want? Exist. Exist. No, it, but they don't want to allow them to exist. Israel doesn't need to exist. The Jews have fought all every war that they've ever fought for existence. And then once you have existence, then you want acceptance. We had this thing called the Gare Wars one time. They were, you know, they were internet bloody, right? <laughs> Technically bloody. Mm -hmm. There were no physical blows, but it was all done through computers because we wanted existence. And then we wanted acceptance. That's why I said, that's why I made this turn. Isn't it odd? It's kind of measure for measure. We want the same thing you want now. And you still don't exist. You, we, you still don't let us have our existence. Or, or the acceptance. But here's what's going to happen. God is serious about this. If you look at Gaza, here's Gaza Strip right here. Here's Israel. Okay? Guess what run and there's a there's a thing that comes out right here. This is called the oil excavation. And this is the Med Sea. Guess guess what is right there? Biggest oil field you ever saw in your life. Mm -hmm. Guess who owns it? Gaza. Guess who supports Gaza? Iran. Guess who controls Iran? Russia. Guess who owns Israel? London. UK. LLC. This, this oil lease, oil ownership, runs out in 2024. Do you think this corporation that owns this corporation called Israel is going to let 
this piece of property that goes with this oil field go to these people who we know is Gog. Uh-uh. They're not. So, we have a situation going on in here. Whether it was done on purpose or it was done by accident, God is cleaning out this and giving it back to Israel. And on the other side of this, this, this will cease to exist because it's a bankrupt corporation. And then we're going to have the Sanhedrin. And then all of a sudden, Israel will be a nation. And all of a sudden, out of the blue, we're going to reinstate the biblical Gerito Shah because we're going to have Levitical, Le Levitical law. Because then it will be legally done. Legally. You see where I'm going with that? This is what's going on in 3D. What's going on in 4D? What is going on in God's... What is, what is God doing? We know God is cleaning out the Klippa, the Hamas, out of the Malchut, because Israel is the Malchut. And He's cleaning it out. So what, does, what is He going to do for the nation? So the nations had this great idea of, of how to take over the world. The Soros group, our government, the U European governments, all, not Russia, not China, not the rest of them. What we're going to do, starting in 2008, is we're going to flood Europe. Uh, looks like Europe, and this is London up here. We're going to flood them from Syria. We're going to flood them from Syria all the way to Germany, everywhere except for Poland. Poland's the only place they don't have Muslims. Do you know what? Oh, yeah. They're the only country in the world that's never had a terrorist attack. So we're going to flood uh, Spain, France, Italy, uh, Europe, Germany. We're going to flood all these place, places with, with these uh, refugees. And then what we're going to do is we're going to do it over here in the USA through the southern border. And we're going to flood all these places around here with the same thing. And during this war that we're going to create over here, we're going to fly hundreds and thousands of refu Palestinian refugees into these places. You go on Monkey Works, you can see the planes leaving out of Egypt with all those people. They're not going to Jordan or Egypt. They're coming here, and they're going here. Why? It's the agent. Because measure for measure, what Esau allowed to happen to Israel is going to happen to Esau. Daniel says, iron and clay don't mix. And it's going to bring down those nations. It's going to destroy the Klippa. Okay? Now, we're going to... And it's fixing to get kinetic here. Look at the college campuses. Look at what's going on. Look at the government. They're fighting in the halls of Congress today. All right? Because we have the Hamas squad in, in our government, in our Congress and Senate. Because they were installed there. So what Israel has had to deal with, and everybody's picked a lane, it's coming home. It's coming, it's coming home to Esau. It's coming here and it's coming in Europe. And we're fixing to have to deal with it on a major, major scale. Now, if you're in Houston, get out of Houston. <laughs> that is, there's 17 cities in the United States that are on a list of get out of us. You need to leave those cities. Houston's the only one in Texas. So, because there's about two million, two million of them in northern Houston. It's crazy. 
But anyway, it's called measure for measure. We're, we're, we're going to have to deal with it because it was set up and staged that way. So what, what's going to happen? God is now going to use the very... He's, he's going to let the 3D do it, but He's orchestrating it. Right? He's going he's gonna, to... Uh, he's going to... Yeah, oh, y'all want to take over the world? Okay. Well, why don't y'all infiltrate Muslims and Christians together? Yeah, let's do that. They'll, they'll kill each other and we'll take over the world. <laughs> From my lair. Right? God's like... Yeah, that's a good idea. I'm glad y'all thought of that. Because what's it going to do? It's going to create anti-Semitism like you've never seen in your life. Saw a video last night. I was looking at this kid from London. He goes, London's done. It's burning. London. I mean, they don't, they're not going to show it on our news. But you can find it on the dark web. London's done. He goes, we're packing up and going back to Israel. They're just not safe here. You, and, the, and the guy goes, well, they're having a war over there. He goes, they're not having a war over there. Gaza's getting destroyed. But Israel proper, you know, it's it's not bad. You know, and, if, and he, Hezbollah is shooting stuff. But see, Israel doesn't have to use the same hands taking care of, with Hezbollah as they do Hamas because Hamas is to, attached to the word Palestine. Hezbollah's not. So gloves are off. We use big we use big guns over there, big bombs, right? It's a whole different thing. Because, because the corporate structure is set up where the world doesn't have to recognize it because the players involved know who owns the land. They're just renters. But as soon as God gives it to them, look what happens. See, you see how it's happening? They're fixing to get the land back and, Jew, and the anti-Semitism that, that is created out of this chaos is driving all the Jews back to their homeland. It's not going to be safe to be here for a Jew because they're going to all the big cities where all the, big, all the Jews live in the big cities. There ain't no Jews live around us. You couldn't hit one with a deer rifle from here. You can shoot for two miles and not, not hit an Orthodox Jew. Further than that. Further than that. Maybe a hundred miles from here. Yeah. Right? In any direction. Mm -hmm. So they're they're gonna go back, and as soon as they go back, here comes the Shekhinah, the chef is coming back. And Israel, Israel is going to be a whole, and everybody's like, well, we need to go get Israel. You're not going to have time to go get Israel because you're going to have so many problems here on your homeland. You're not even going to be thinking about the land of Israel. It's going to be so bad. What well, that's what's coming. Not only that, but but the collapse of the financial system and everything's coming with it. Because for Mashiach to get here, I thought the financial system has to be one to one worldwide. That's number eighteen in the Kol Hator of the 156 things that must happen. That's Deuteronomy 25, 14. There cannot be two measurements in my house, one big and one small. Right? So, that is prophesied of Daniel. That's what's going on here. That's what it says in Isaiah 60, 18. That's what we learned about in, in uh, Noah, about Hamas. Nothing new. And uh, Israel yesterday, the government decided that they were going to give marriage certificates to homosexuals that are in the military. You don't think that the religious Jews are fixing to get rid of that government and put their own in? You see, God allows things to happen for his own good. Because he's going he's gonna, to, he's gonna out of chaos comes clarity. Out of tolerance comes intolerance. God's going to tolerate it so long that it's intolerant. People are like that too. You can push it down my throat so far, and after that I'm like, hey, that's enough. Right? It doesn't matter what it is. But now you can see that the Jew doesn't want to be called Palestinian no more than we want to be called Noahide. It's a toxic word. But boy, it'll trigger. Just do it. I found out. 
I found out real quick. It's amazing how you, you can see the racism in it. It's uncanny. Uncanny. So let's learn from let's learn some volley. How much time we got, Brad? Thirty minutes. Perfect. We are in verse chapter fourteen. We're in Genesis twenty nine. We're in Genesis twenty. Uh, I mean, sorry, page page twenty nine in Genesis chapter fourteen, in verse nine. And with Heldomar, king of Elam, title, the king of Begoyim, Amraphel, king of Shinar, and Arioch, king of Elazar, four kings against five. And I'm going to go ahead and read, read, read the narrative here till as far as we're probably going to go. The valley of Siddim was full of bitumen wells. The kings of Sodom and Gomorrah fell into them, while the rest fled to a mountain. They seized all the wealth of Sodom and Gomorrah and all their food, and they departed. And they captured Lot and his possessions, Abram's nephew. And they left, for he was residing in Sodom. That's where we're headed today. Rob Valley says in verse... In, in, in verse 9, we're going to learn some mechanics of war. Why God does what he does. I learned this, I, I was watching a rabbi, and he goes, he goes, you have to be careful in, in, in death and in war. And he gives an example. There was, in Egypt, the Egyptians were taking Jewish babies and stuffing them in the walls of the bricks. And building bricks. <clears throat> that's live babies. It, it's it's horrendous. It's it's atrocious. It's exactly the sort of thing that happened, all, you know, on the seventh. The unspeakable things that happen. And our sages come to tell us these were the Gilgal of those from Nimrod that wanted the Tower of Babel that says, "Let us make bricks and a tower to heaven and overthrow heaven." And so their tacoon and their Gilgal was, they became a brick. So, in war, there is death. There is mutilation. There's all these things. What is Hashem doing with that? What, it's all about tacoon. The whole thing. Why does God save people, even wicked people, in war? And he does it all the time. Miracles. We're going to see one here. He did a miracle. God did a miracle for the king of Sodom and the king of Gomorrah. He only does it for one reason. What do you think that reason is? I'll give you a hint. Nineveh. Because he wants you to recognize that you couldn't have done it on your own power. That something must have happened so that you would repent. That's his, that's his thing. Alright? Because you got to understand, God's running both sides of war. He's the judge, the jury, the executioner. And he's the one that will forgive the whole thing. He, he's, he's all of it. So here's what Rob always says. Ariat, king of Elisar. If it is already said in verse 8, and engaged in battle, how did these five kings act willfully to stage the war against the four kings who were very much stronger than they were? And they also saw their victory, the four kings, they also saw their victory as though they were like dogs fixing a fight against the lions. And the proverb is like in the inner meaning and in its extension, as they were certainly like brazen, greedy dogs. 
that did not recognize their weakness and provoked these beasts, these men. And their boldness and greed was no advantage to them at all. Is this not what's going on today? Because the beasts, the four kings, slew them. And the men came down upon them with a rod. And why does it return and say in verse 9, four kings against five? Why does it? We already knew it was four kings against five. As if, it, as if we did not know how to count the total after they were detailed by name except to allude to the fact that the attack was not thought of according to the number, but as a single weapon of iron that shatters and breaks asunder. Many, many trees, because the overcoming depends upon the attack, not who you are or how many you got, but are you prepared for the attack? And not the number. And there are these brazen, greedy dogs that relied and trusted in their numbers. And they did not know or understand their weaknesses. And we have already explained previously the Valley of Sedim, Shadim, where the Valley of Demons was called that because it was the place of the extraction. There were hordes of demons, Shadim, and damaging spirits and rooted and and they rooted and defeated the wars and it was also known that the ones who fell through these shading were like birds that were seized and stuck in the bitumen these the bitumen wells are like tar pits and they were not able to escape and this is the reason that the matter says in support in verse 10. So I'll read verse 9, and then we'll go to verse 10. With Hedlomar, the king of Elam, Tidal, the king of Goin, uh, Amraphel, king of Shinar, and Ariok, king of Elisar, four kings against five. And it says in support in verse 10, the valley of Sadim was full of bitumen wells. Now, these men knew the area. So how did they fall into the... That's how they thought they could win. The kings of Sodom and Gomorrah fell into the, fell in, uh, fled and fell into them while the rest fled to the mountain. The valley of Sedim was full of bitumen wells because just as they allude to that which was mentioned, that here, bitumen, was a kind of mud or tar that stuck like glue that those that fell into it are not able to escape except through a miracle. Like one who falls through a shading. Therefore, you ever seen that movie with Angelina Jolie and she's looking for the, for the uh, Pandora's box and, and she's going into the jungle and these shading are coming out of they coming out of the trees, and when they go back, it makes it like a black, gooey tar thing. That's what I that's what I visualize when I when I'm reading this. And therefore, the sages of blessed memory stated that the kings of Sodom and Gomorrah that fell there were saved miraculously, and that they would believe respectively in the rescue of our father Abraham from the fiery furnace. See, he's, see, even when, when bad things happen to bad people and God rescues them, it's so that they, can, they would realize how God rescued Abraham. He's trying to get it in their head. That, that was all miraculous, that it would be possible to happen through nature. They knew it couldn't have happened in they, they knew God saved them, in other words. You ain't coming out of that. The shading have you and the bitumen wells have you. And that which is written, and the kings of Sodom and Gomorrah fled and fell into them as they fled 
from the war and fell into the pits, into the wells. And they were not rescued on their own merits, except in the order that they would believe, both of them, and, and all human beings in the miracle of Abraham. And that they would recognize and know that there is a God that can rescue as he wants and desires by doing miracles. Even for the backside. The thing that got me out of Christianity, the last day that I kicked the door and walked out and told them where they could put it. I was in Benny Hinn's ministry. That whole thing, right? We were having, uh, we were having uh, healing services. You know? And all these people lined up to get healed. And they said, you know, Jesus healed me, whatever, right? And he said, make sure you tell them that, you know, pray, you need to praise Jesus that he healed you. And I said, well, you know, me. <laughs> so what happens if you don't? Oh, they didn't have enough faith. Oh, so it's the person's fault, right? I said, so you're telling me that this guy over here that's got a hangnail that gets healed from his hangnail has more faith than this person that's dying from cancer? Is that what you're trying to tell me? Because, see, God heals those people, even though they're doing it in the name of Jesus. He heals them hoping you will repent and see that the miracle can only come from God. I don't care if Buddha's doing it, Harry Krishna's doing it, I don't care who's doing it, God's doing it. There's nothing here but God. And he's hoping that you live long enough to repent. And perhaps th that's this perhaps if this person dies with cancer, it's their tacoon. It's all about tacoon and repentance. Even war. Because God's merciful. Even injustice. And if you will say, therefore, it applies to Abraham, who was attached to the God of truth, but, but he, God, also aroused to save those who were attached to lies. Shecker. He's going to save the... He, he's going to do miracles for them too. To see if they will acknowledge him. Did you have, when that happened, I said, that is the biggest load of, you know what I, I said, yeah. You know, I said, no, I, and this is what I told him. I said, no, if you're going to give Jesus all the credit, you better give him all the blame. If he don't do it, he's the blame. That person's got plenty of faith. You know, you can't blame Jesus. Yes, you can. Know that. Hashem, may he be blessed, saved them at that time to see if they would return in repentance and, and return from their evil deeds. But that did not take it, but they did not take it to heart. And they did not fear to make rectification. So the judge of all the earth sent the evil den from above, from heaven, in the form of Gabriel that they could not be rescued from it. And through it, his name, may he be blessed, would be exalted in any case. Because everyone knew that the rescue from the bitumen was only for the needs of the moment to see if they would return in repentance. And the purpose was that if it did not return in repentance, the calamity would be sent upon them. God's going to give you so many opportunities, and after that, the den, you're going to track the den, the den going to come get you. How long has Hashem been long-suffering with Hamas? No more. It's over. I'm telling you. They're not going to stop. And it's not Israel. It's the God of Israel. And the praise of Abraham standing in his place. And he did not lose anything. Because his rescue was a complete rescue. And it was established because he was a complete tzaddik. And because he was a complete tzaddik, and if it were not for the fact that the king of Sodom was mentioned, 
when he went out to meet Abraham, we would not have known that he had been rescued as the Torah is not strict and meticulous except to write about their falling into the pit. But not, but it doesn't mention, it's not about their rescue because they were completely wicked and they would not have been rescued except for the two reasons that are mentioned. That they had confidence retrospectively regarding Abraham's rescue from the furnace and, and waiting to see if they would make rectification fully like Nineveh. He told Nineveh, Jonah told Nineveh, you got 40 days and then it's over. It's over. Right? Fully, and behold, the kings of Sodom and Gomorrah were the most important of the five kings, and therefore their falling into the bitumen was mentioned as it makes an impression as it was an omen, an evil omen, that they were the worst, bad, inferior. And they, the people, could not take an omen, a sign from them. And therefore, there was a consolation of escape to the mountain for the people. As this alludes to the Hesed. It doesn't say mountains, it says a mountain. And also... And also wait for them to see if they would repent wholeheartedly in seeing the fall of the vile kings that were the most important ones. And this is what is written in verse 10. While the rest fled to a mountain. And behold, in any case, the victorious four kings took, captured, and seized the next verse. Lot. You see the iteration. You see the holography. You see, the end is Luther in the beginning. The same thing. These evil kings, these evil men, who God has been very patient with, took another lot. They took 240 lots. What did God do to Sodom and Gomorrah over one man? What do you think he's going to do to God's over 240? telling you. God ain't playing. And, verse 11, and, and so I'll read verse 10. And, and the valley of Sidim was full of bitumen wells and the king of Sodom and Gomorrah fled and fell into them while the rest fled to a mountain. Verse 11. They seized all the wealth of Sodom and, and all their food and departed and they captured Lot and his possessions. Nothing new under the sun. And verse 11. Because they were boasting in their victory as if their power and their might was their hand had got them all this wealth. Please turn with me to Deuteronomy 8, 17, page 449. This is what's going on with these people right now that are trying to run the world, trying to take over the world. What's fixing to come upon them, ladies and gentlemen, is going to be biblical. Yeah. Page 449, Deuteronomy 8. 814? 8, 17. 17. And you may say in your heart, my strength and the might of my hand made me this great wealth. Read the next one. That you shall remember, Hashem your God, that it is He who gives the strength to make wealth in order to establish a covenant that He swore with His forefathers in this day. Hashem is fixing to take all the wealth of the nations and got them with it. I'm telling you, it's all coming back home. All the silver is His, all the gold is His. He allowed the nations to build up their, their world. He allowed all these people to do this. With a, with a contract of an LLC because the klepa precedes the fruit. And now he's going to clean all the roaches out. But the power and might is not dependent on, on its masters. And therefore Hashem, may he be blessed, gives the power to the tzaddik after chasing after them and overcoming them and prevailing 
to inform that everything is from him. And the arm of flesh is not thought of as anything in his eyes. And how will this matter regarding Abram, a man of Hesed, kindness, be brought about for him to change, to have his switch flipped, to be a man of war? Because there is no miracle or wonder like the change in the nature of a man, except that love and the brotherhood covers it. As behold, it was told to him, Abram, Lot, the son of his brother, had been taken hostage. And although this had been brought about, he, Abram, Abram, was immediately aroused to rescue him due to the kingship and the relative and, and, and the, his relatives and the connection. And also the power was given to him from heaven to do the rescue for those two reasons. First, to inform, to show how great the power of a tzaddik is. As he is, as he is overseen by Hashem, may he be blessed. And he has no fear of a large number, hordes of evil demons, or the tyrants, or the oppressors, and there was nothing standing against them, because they had nothing but the arm of flesh. And the second reason, to inform and to show that the Hesed kindness also includes Gevura. And even though the Gevura comes out of it, it was not so. If, if it was not so, then Isaac would have not come forth from Abraham. And it is already known that Isaac is the secret of Gevura. And that it came out of the Hesed. And if you will say, what are the signs of Gevura? That that are seen in Isaac like those that were seen in Abraham in the war of the kings. Know and see that a great sign of Gavura was seen in Isaac and that there was nothing like him in the world. He was a bad man, as bad as he wanted to be. And it was like the matter that our sages of blessed memory have said, he who is mighty conquers and subdues his Yitzur his inclination. Because he gives over his nephesh unto death. Is, is this not what the IBF is doing today? Why are they brave? Because they give their nephesh over to death, their soul over to death, and they fear nothing. No demons, no rephaim, no nephilim, no nothing. The pure, pure Gevura when you take something that belongs to them as a people. Like a person. They ain't not worried about the house. But you take the person in the house, it's on like Donkey Kong. Because God gives them the power to do whatever they want to do. Mm -hmm. Because he gives over his nephesh unto death to the will of his Father in heaven and his father on earth. That's his dad. And he, Isaac, was 37 years old. And he could have stood against Abraham. But nevertheless, he subdued his Yitzhak and was submissive. And it was not impossible. And there was no greater Gevura than this, <clears throat> which without a doubt, is the case. Returning to our matter, Ramani says, that the verse comes to tell us why Abram's war aroused to enter, to put himself into this great danger of war of the victorious kings. And on this matter, it is said in support in verse 12. How much time we got, brother? 10 minutes. Okay, let's do another one. Well, I um, only have uh, a little bit in verse 12. So we'll do a little bit in verse 12 here, and we'll shut her down. So we'll go back and read 11. Then they seized all the wealth of Sodom and Gomorrah, and they took all their food, and they departed. And they captured Lot and his possessions, Abram's nephew, and they left, for he was residing in Sodom. 
You see, when you take a Jew and you take him to a wicked place, that makes it worse on that person. It's the coordinate that brings it down. Gaza, Aza is Hamas. It is, it is the Klippa of, of Israel. So what do they do? They take them into the Klippa. That makes it worse on them. This, these are principles of Torah, of heaven. Right? <clears throat> no getting out of it. And they captured Lot and his wealth, Abram's nephew, and left. Because it says, Abram's nephew. To allude to the fact that a man of Hesed like Abraham could certainly not bear the pain and the sorrow and the grief of his relative. And even though he was moved and aroused more than sorrow and grief itself, what he's saying is here, what overcomes the sorrow and grief of an Israeli being captured? The fact that they were captured. Now we're going to come smoke you. See, it changes that. It goes from sorrow and grief to we're going to come do whatever it takes. Fearlessness. That's what happened to Abraham. Mm -hmm. And the matter says, for he was residing in Sodom. To allude to the fact that his residing and living in Sodom caused it. Just like Gaza. It caused it. Because woe to the evil Russia, the evil one, and woe to his evil dwelling. And the Torah is amazing, and the sages are amazing. We'll see you next week. Mm -hmm.